Hello, everybody, and welcome to our last uh, of the a single factor ANOVAs, uh, this time an observational study. Now, I say the last, there's still randomized block to do, there's still factorial to do, we still have lots more to do, but this is the last of, I'm sorry to say, the simpler ones. The other ones will get a little more tedious, a little more time consuming. Now, this is the fourth one of these that I've done in module 13, so I'm going to keep this exercise brief. I'm going to keep this video brief. Let's get to the point and we'll just go through step by step by step how to do this test. Let's go. Students in different college majors are always complaining or maybe bragging about how difficult their field of study is relative to another. You decide that perhaps you could use the number of hours spent studying as a proxy for the level of difficulty. The more hours spent studying, the more difficult the subject matter must be. You survey students across three fields of study and ask them how many hours per day do they study uh, outside of class time. The following table contains our summary data. So we're looking at three groups, the accountants uh, and a couple of scientists, the physics uh, folks and the sociologists. Now, we have our sample size, we have our averages, and our standard deviation. What is our first step? State the null and alternative hypotheses, always. Here we go, our null is that they are all the same for accounting, for physics, and for sociology. They all come from the same distribution. The alternative, at least one is different, or not all of them are equal. The first step now in our calculations, under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, and all of these samples are coming from the same distribution, there's no difference between them, we need our point estimate for that common population mean, the grand mean. So the grand mean is a weighted average of our sample means, divide that by our total number of observations. So here I have 16 times 427 plus 14 times 431 and 17 times 381 divided by Total number of observations, 16 plus 14 plus 17. This gives me a grand mean. I'm actually going to write this up here just so that I can erase everything, keep it clean. 16 times 427 plus 14 times 431 plus 17 times 381 divided by 16 and 14 and 17. That gives me a grand mean of 4.116. Okay, I can clear out those calculations. I've got what I need. Let's produce our ANOVA. So I have our source treatments, our source error, and total, we have sum of squares, degrees of freedom, mean square, F, P, critical F. Now we don't have a level of significance given to us, so when in doubt, we'll choose 0.05. Okay, and let's just get our lines in here. All right, starting with SSTR, where we're looking at adding across all of these differences between sample means, the grand mean squared, multiply through by sample size. We've got different sample sizes, so unfortunately, we can't take any easy shortcuts here. So let's get going 
our sample size I have 16 times 4 my sample means 427 so 16 times 4.27 minus the grand mean which was 4.116 squared our next one physics I have a sample mean of four, sorry, a sample size of 14, sample mean of 431. So there's 14, 431 minus our grand mean squared. And the next one, sociology, sample size 17, sample mean 381. 17, 381, minus 4.16 squared. Okay, and again, I always like to do these in individual pieces. It makes it easier to catch mistakes. And as we get into randomized block and factorial, the next de novas, these calculations grow a little bit. So it's just, for me, it's good habit. You don't have to. Certainly, if you are comfortable just doing it all together. So that first one squared times 16. So here I have 0 0.3, let's call it 38. Next one, 431 minus 4116 squared times 14, 0 0.53. And the next one, 381 minus 4116 squared times 17, 1.59. Add those up. And I have my SSTR 2.5. Degree of freedom, number of samples minus 1. I have two again, so that mean square, two and a half divided by two, 1.25. Moving on, SSE. Once you go through a few of these, I hope that you find they become easier, right? You get into a bit of a routine, you know the steps the steps are always the same. The problem with these types of exercises is making silly little calculation errors. And, you know, making a mistake is one thing, being able to identify it and, and recognize that, oh my goodness, that doesn't seem right, and going back and, and solving it, well, that just takes practice, which is what we're doing. So, the first one, this is gonna be 16 minus one times that sample variance. So here I have to notice I'm given a standard deviation, so I do have to make sure I square these. There's 0.71 for the first one. The next one, 14 minus one. And our sample standard deviation here is given as 1.02. So that's gonna be 14 minus one times 1.02 squared. And the last one, 17 minus one times our sample standard deviation here is 0.94. So there's 0.94 squared. So again, I'm gonna go through all of this uh, in steps, just to make sure I don't make any silly mistakes. 15 times 0.71 squared. So here I have 756. Well, I guess that's 756 too. Then I have 13 times 1.02 squared. There's 13.53 and 16 times 0.94 squared. 
14.14. Add those together. And I have my mean squared error 35.23. Almost there. Degrees of freedom. N T minus K our total number of observations again I'm adding up those individual sample sizes so 16 and 14 and 17 I have NT is equal to 47 K I have three samples again so K is equal to 3 so 47 minus 3 I have 44 degrees of freedom mean squared error 35.22 divided by 44, 0 0.8. Okay, we're so close, we're almost done. Let's just finish up our ANOVA. SST, 2.5 plus 35.22. That gives me 37.72. Degrees of freedom, again, this is a helpful little double check on your work because it's always NT minus one, which we can all agree is a simple calculation. NT is 47, so this is 46, and it's always equal to the sum of degrees of freedom above. So there's 44, there's two, and that checks out. I've got 46 degrees of freedom. Almost there, our test statistic, MSTR over MSE. I have 1.25 over 0.8. Gives me a test statistic of 1.56. From which F distribution are we working with? Again, that is defined by its degrees of freedom. I have 2 in the numerator, I have 44 in the denominator. So that defines the variant of our F distribution. I'm going to come down to my F tables, 2 and 44, and one more page, there's 2, and I don't have 44, we'll have to round it to 40. And there's my relevant F values. Now we're going to do this at the 05 level of significance. So that gives me my critical value of 3.23. So I can put that back into my ANOVA here. 3.23. And certainly I can already see, using the critical value approach, I can already see what my outcome is going to be. Because here I have my critical value of 3.23, giving me an area in that upper tail of 0.05. Well, our test statistic, somewhere way back here, that test statistic was about one and a half, 1.56. Well, given that that critical value defines my rejection space, and of course simultaneously my do not reject space, well, I can already draw my conclusion. Let's just get a best guess for our p-value, just for completeness. But here I can certainly see that if this region is equal to 0.05, well, certainly this region here it's going to be much larger than 0.05. Let's go to our F tables, come back down to our relevant set of values. Yeah, look, my test statistic is smaller than the smallest value. The smallest value here is 2.4, and that corresponds to a probability of 0.1. So that smallest value in the table, 2.4, somewhere around here, and that purple region is equal to 0 
Well then certainly my p-value, which is all of that blue region, got to be greater than 0.1. So there's our p-value. We have our critical value. Both are pointing us in the same direction that we have insufficient evidence to reject our null hypotheses. We are unable to show based on using number of hours spent studying as a proxy for the level of difficulty, we are unable to show that there exists any difference in the level of difficulty between these three majors. Okay, that's it for this last single factor ANOVA, this observational study. I think we knocked it out in about 15 minutes, maybe 16 minutes. That's got to be good time. We did go through it very quickly. Again, this was the fourth of these problems. So hopefully by now you've got a good idea of the, the pattern, of the, the flow, all of the steps necessary for these types of problems. The tricky part in these exercises are these tedious calculations because it is so easy. You know, you're just pressing buttons on your calculator. It's so easy to miss a button and it throws everything off. So we just have to be careful when we're doing those calculations. The rest, the process, not too dissimilar from other types of tests that you've done. Okay, so that's about it. Given that we did not reject the null hypotheses, we do not have to do part B, because if we are unable to show that a difference exists, then why would we do Fisher's LSD to find the difference if we've already stated that there aren't any? So we don't have to do part B. It is not necessary. Okay, thank you all for watching. I hope this was helpful. Bye-bye.